Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend, and today we're going to be studying the food of the working poor, the most primitive of breads, the journey of the journey cake. Thanks for joining us as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. I've always been fascinated by the lives of the working poor, the downtrodden in 18th century America and other parts of the world. And when we look at their lives, we're immediately drawn to what their food, what their diet is like. And these things can be very difficult to research because poor people food does not make it into a fancy person's cookbook, does it? We only get descriptions of the food and sometimes that's very, very scanty. But this particular topic, this idea of the simple breads that people eat in the 18th century, well, that we get over and over wonderful descriptions so we can really dig into this topic and it's so much fun. So in North America, the classic simple bread is the cornbread or thirded bread sometimes made or Rhine Injun bread that's sometimes referenced. And then we get the classic Johnny cake or journey cake. And these are simple unleavened uh, cakes of bread that are sometimes maybe cooked on a griddle or they're cooked on a gridiron. They are uh, a round, simple, like a puck of bread, right? Kind of hard, but very, very popular. They're, they can fit in your pocket. You can warm them up by the fire and um, they are simple, simple to make. But are they invented in North America? No. They're an adaptation of a kind of food that we that we find in Europe and specifically in Great Britain in the 18th century. Almost a direct connection or direct ancestor uh, that we find back in Great Britain is the oat cake or even barley cakes. And these are very popular in Scotland, in Northern England, and in other parts of Great Britain. And how are they made? They're made out of the simplest materials. We just need flour, salt, and a little bit of water. And what's the last um, ingredient of bread? Leavening. Well, in this case, it's optional. We don't even need that. So let's talk about the grains for a second. Um, typically, when we're baking bread, we're thinking about wheat flour, but wheat in the 18th century is fairly expensive. And even if wheat grows in your area, you're more likely as a poor farmer to sell off your wheat and either to use your own homegrown or buy cheaper grains to use for your bread. So uh, in Scotland, in Northern England, the inexpensive grain is oatmeal or oat flour. So they're gonna, they're gonna grind a fine oatmeal or oat flour. If you're in other parts, maybe barley is the grain that you're going to use for your inexpensive bread or rye in North America. Again, wheat might grow in your area, but you're gonna sell that wheat, you're gonna export it, and you're gonna use corn instead. The classic meal that everyone uses. The problem is these grains, like oats, um, barley meal, and corn, they do not make a classic bread that wheat does. It doesn't have that gluten in there. It doesn't puff up and make this nice and fluffy bread. It makes a dense, dense loaf. and. Those poor farmers, soldiers, sailors, they were used to this kind of very, very dense bread. Sometimes they even complained about that light and fluffy bread, say, it goes right through me. I need something dense with lots of energy in it. We've got our flour here already, and so let's mix up some, some dough so that we can cook it in a couple of different cooking methods that are mentioned uh, multiple times, both here in, in North America and in Great Britain. So I've just got a good bit of uh, flour here and this is this is mixed it's ground both very fine and then there are some pieces in it that aren't so fine uh, you don't find a modern uh, grind like this is but it's what you would get if you just did a, a quick grinding of yourself and these grains were sort of hand ground in the area corn was pounded out in a mortar and in uh, Scotland they had um, little corns little hand mills that they would mill out their own grain with We've got some salt here. Almost all of them contain some sort of salt. You would only omit the salt if you didn't have any salt or it had some other ingredient that, that gave you a salt 
uh, like flavor. Occasionally, something like alum might be used in your breads. Well, we're gonna mix that up when it's still dry. Let's go ahead and add some water. Nice and warm here, but it's by the fire. That'll help us out. Let's see if I've got enough. So this mixture is looking really good. There are multiple variations of this kind of bread. And part of the variation is how thick you make the dough. And uh, so, I mean, we can, we can make a real thin batter that's almost poured out, and, or we can make a, a very stiff cake. This is something nice and in between, a nice soft dough here that we can work with, kind of sticky. We're gonna let it set just a little bit. Um, different versions, and we'll probably talk about this in a future episode, um, might, might be left for a greater uh, period of time. But in this particular one, we're just gonna leave this set for 10 or 15 minutes to sort of absorb that moisture. The mix looks good. These have sort of had time to rest them a little bit, and then I uh, tore them up into little bits and made them into these little cakes. Very simple. They can be made in different, uh, different sizes or shapes, depending on what you need. And we're gonna cook these in some of the most primitive ways possible. And what we've got here is a nice big flat stone. And I've heated this up on the fire. It takes a, a good while to heat this up. If they were a, a more well-to-do household, uh, they might not use a stone, but they would use what we would call a griddle today. So not only are there multiple, multiple names for these little cakes, but there are multiple names for the pieces of equipment. This, they're so regional. There's, I, you know, obviously we might call this, uh, or the, the metal plate version, a griddle, but sometimes you see them, uh, they call them a gurgle or even a girdle. So it's just really strange that you have all these different uh, interesting names for the oat cakes themselves. So you might call them oat cakes, bannocks, yannicks, annex. Uh, they had names like um, tharf cake or thar cake, which actually means hearth cake, right? And uh, here, by the time they get to North America, they're called uh, maybe bannocks, or they might be called the Johnny cakes or the journey cakes. Our cakes are ready to try out, but I want to read to you this little piece out of uh, William Ellis's Country Housewife Family Companion. This is 1750, one of the very best books of the time period to give us an idea about what a, a normal uh, poor farmer's diet is like, what his life is like. And uh, here's a little section where he's talking about oatmeal and oat cakes. Here they make, he's talking about North Eng Northern England, uh, here they make a vast consumption of oatmeal, having but little wheat growing in these parts. And with them they make cakes that supply bread by mixing oatmeal with water and a little salt. Um, they knead it into a dough and batter and bake it like pancakes on a stone that has a fire under it. So that's just a very tiny little bit. It goes on to explain um, in several different places. Um, very similar cakes like this, unleavened little cakes. These are the oatmeal ones. These aren't, aren't Johnny cakes because they're not made with cornmeal, but um, all, exactly the same you know, method of cooking, um, making these little cakes. You can make a thin batter and bake it, you know, make them like pancakes, or you can make little, little cakes like these. And um, these, because of the, the, the way the dough is made up and it's kind of aged a little bit, and because of the meal having different particle sizes, they're actually nice and soft, very sort of fluffy. And these are still warm, so steam is coming out of them. Now, many times they might make a year's worth or a half a year's worth of these ahead of time and let them dry out. And they'd come back and warm them by the fire and um, put butter on them or something like that to, to make them uh, tasty. But these, just like this, right off the fire, a lot like a fire cake or an ash cake, that a soldier would make actually very, very tasty, very savory. If you've cooked it on the stone with butter, well, then you get some of that butter flavor. But these are actually wonderful. Uh, a, a great experiment for you at home. If you want to try something out like this, just so simple, make up these different, you can try out barley, cornmeal, rye meal, or uh, the oat flour like this, 
you can uh, cook them, you know, uh, on a, on a outside on a on a with a fire like this, or even just sort of fry them up in a little bit of butter. Make these little cakes. A wonderful, uh, interesting experiment. I really love these sorts of things and perfect for camping. All you need to do is bring a little bit of salt and your flour and you know you're going to have water with you um, already. So just a, a wonderful journey food and if you make them up ahead of time you can put them in your bag, carry them along with you, break them out, eat them whenever you need them. These oat cakes or Johnny cakes give us the perfect glimpse of what life was like for these just very, very common folk of the 18th century. The, the kinds of foods that you don't find in cookbooks, but that they ate every single day of their lives. Such a, a wonderful way to sort of walk in their shoes. I really want to thank you for coming along on this experiment. You know, it wasn't, it's not so much as a cooking episode as a, a history episode about this very, very simple food. Thanks for coming along as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century.